Welcome back to the channel. We're gonna continue working on our 1993 Mustang GT convertible. It's time to get it ready for the painting gnomes. And I got a little bit of mechanical work that I need to finish up from last time. So let's get it all done. So the first thing we need to do since this thing now runs and drives is fix our brake lights. If you notice when I backed off the trailer, I did mention something, we had no brake lights. Now that's not such a big deal. We don't really need those right now, except for we can't take it out of park. You have to turn the key to the ignition, unlock, and then take it out of park, put it in neutral, then start it, and then go through your gears, drive it around once you put it in park. It won't come back out till you shut the ignition off and do that whole scenario all over again. So it's a pretty common failure on these things. It's the boo switch. Yes, I said that right. Ford's great acronym for brake on off switch. Uh, the wires, the switch is actually on the brake pedal and the wires move with it. Well, wires don't flex all that great, so they end up breaking off literally right at the terminal. So climb on under here and we'll take a look and see if my guess is right. The supervisor is headed back to her office. She was working the teleprompter for me. Let's climb underneath here. It's hard to see. It's right above that little bracket there. Let's see if I can get you on better position. This is about as good as it's gonna get. They put that switch right above that bracket, but you can see the plug. It's got the two wires going to it. That plug right there, and it's not connected to anything. That might be our problem. Usually the wires break off at the end of the plug, but ours are fine. It's just unsnapped for some reason. So we'll plug that back in. Maybe it came off in the accident. I'm not sure, but it should be fixed now. Yep, our brake lights work. We'll worry about that third brake light later. So we'll head up to the front of the car and pull our bumper cover off of here. Put that off to the side. And we're gonna put our hood latch in. We've been avoiding this. Reconnect our hood cable. Just wraps around the little curly Q. And it snaps into the hood latch. And then we'll put the screw on there. Tighten it down. We'll start our screws in the hood latch. These things have dinner plate size washers on them. And we'll tighten it down in the center and see how close it is to where it belongs. There's plenty of adjustment if we're off. Make sure it's hitting our hood in the right spot. Close it and see how it fits. Our gaps look pretty good. The height is wrong, but that's what they made the rubber baby buggy bumpers for. So we can just spin those out and adjust it. And our hood cable works. So it didn't change our gaps at all, we're good. I wanted the supervisor's approval, but she's too busy taking a nap. Big surprise. Now she wants to know why I'm not working. I wanna pull these moldings off. We're just using some welding wire, working it back and forth to cut the two-sided tape on the back. Uh, these moldings have an aluminum strip in the back, so you don't wanna just pull out on them, because once you bend that aluminum strip, they never stay on there. They never flatten back out. So you either have to pull the aluminum strip out of it or don't bend it in the first place. I'm gonna go with don't bend it in the first place. This one looks pretty good. Not sure why I saved it. Maybe I'll use it on the next car. We're gonna go onto the door. We need to get this out of the way so the bodywork gnome can do his bodywork. I've lost interest in the welding wire method, so we're gonna go with the old spatula method. Now uh, you can use this, just resist the urge to pull out on that molding and bend the aluminum strip in the back. And we'll slowly cut both sides until it falls off. And there's one little part that we couldn't really get with the spatula, so we'll finish it off with the welding wire. And our molding's off, still straight. We don't have to remove those aluminum pieces. Now we just need to pull the rest of our two-sided tape off of here. So for that, we'll use the magic eraser. Supervisor has to make sure I'm doing it the right way, I guess. 
if you're looking to take the glue off your car and you don't want to do it by hand, you can pick these up in my Amazon store. Let me translate that look for you. Are you going to finish this or what? No, I lost interest. So we're going to head up to the front of the car and pull the wipers off. Just pull them back. There's a little lever that locks them in. And if we pull that lever all the way out, it locks the wiper out and disengages the lock. And it pops right off. Same thing on the other side. Also, when it's on that lock, it gives you a little leverage to pull it off the shaft. Now with the wiper arms out of the way, we can pull our cowl screen out of here. Just a bunch of screws. This is back in the day when I didn't try to hide screws. Just left them wide out in the open there. We can lift it up and we need to disconnect our washer hose, but we do have to be careful because this plastic does get brittle and we don't want to break the washer nozzle. We'll just gently twist it and pull it off of there. It survived. Now we can pull our moldings off little tab we just opened up the tab with the edge of the screwdriver I had already pulled the other end of the molding out from underneath the pillar moldings when the fender was off getting back on to be a little trickier let me go ahead and throw our little snorkel in here for our air box goes in from the outside there's some studs that go through the apron we'll put the nuts on those now this is how you know you have one of those very rare unmolested fox bodies because I believe the first mod you are required to do when hacking a fox body apart is the cold air intake. So this one still has the original air box and snorkel and everything. Now we're going to bolt our mass airflow sensor back to our tower. And tighten it up to our throttle body. We can put the bottom of our air box in. Just has some rubber feet on the bottom that sit on that rail. And slides into our rubber mounts. And it must have got everything in the right spot because it fits. And we can install our air filter. And drop the top to our air box in there. Slide it over the mass airflow sensor. And clip it all in. And tighten up our last hose clamp. Now we're going to deal with our melted ground wire here. While I was pulling the bumper off, the car had a little pigtail here for us. So we cut it off. Make sure it plugs in before we go cutting anything. And it looks like everything we need. We'll unbolt our old ground. And bolt our new one in. Not sure if it would have made a difference, but I have it, so I might as well change it. It just runs up here to the battery. Somebody zip tied this on here. Somebody's definitely been here before. We'll cut off that old butt connector and toss that wiring harness in the pile. Strip our wires. And we'll put a heat shrink butt connector on there. I'm sure that triggers the internet, but hey, it was better than what was on there. Now we'll use our hair dryer to shrink that connector. Seems like our hair dryer is dying. It's a good thing I don't need to use it for anything else. There we go. We got a nice weather tight seal and a connector that's not melted. So we'll drop our battery in here. If we can manage not to get the wire stuck underneath it. Hold down in there and our hold down bolt. Bring it down to manufacturer specs. 
give it a shake and make sure it's going to stay in there. And now we can put our battery cables back on. Tighten them down with a wrench. I guess we're not in a hurry today. So we'll go with the caveman method. We'll tighten this one down. And we need to do something with this wire. I put it on. It's not in the right spot. Somebody's changed it before. So we're going to put it down here. There's a cover that goes over the top, and the way it was sticking up before, it would have interfered with that cover. So now we moved it so we can put the cover on. If you were wondering, yes, I did do that with the battery connected because danger is my middle name. Not really. My middle name is way dumber than that. Some more wires in the way. Put them underneath. There's a slot in the bottom of that that slips over the rail. And a couple push pins. And everything's hidden. Now we can put in our fog lights and our lower bumper support. There's a couple bolts in the back. Go on the bumper shocks. So we'll get one started. And we'll hang on that so we can do the other side. And there's a couple bolts that come in from the front that go through our reinforcement. Turn everything up. And we can plug in our fog lights. Apparently this side is one of those Bluetooth fog lights. This light was sitting in the front seat when I got it, so I'm assuming the tow truck driver must have picked it up, or the auction put it in there. Whoever did, I'm glad they did. They saved me a couple bucks. Plug our light in. There's a tab that sticks up on the bottom, so we'll set the light into that. And there's a tab that it clips into on the top. And now we'll check our lights. And of course the one that was knocked out works, and the other one doesn't. We're going to have to figure out why. Give it the customary tap 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 a -roo, see if that fixes it. It didn't, so we're going to have to get into some more advanced diagnostics. We'll pop our light out of here. And we'll clip our test light on our ground and check our power. We got everything we need. Our light should be working. That means our bulb is burnt out. Much better than having to find a broken wire somewhere. So we'll unplug the power side. Unclip our light bulb. And it pops out of there. You can actually see the filament is broken, so really didn't have to test the power and ground. I could have just looked at it. We'll drop our new bulb in there. Close the little clip back up and plug it in. And it seems to be working. So set it on the bottom tab and clip it in on the top. And I know the internet has trust issues, so you have to see both of them working at the same time. Otherwise, you would accuse me of taking the ball by the other side. But they both work. Now we're going to strip down our fender, our old fender, take a little 5.0 badge off of there that was barely hanging on. Two-sided tape was a little old. And we need our brackets for our GT molding. So we're going to grind the rivets off. We just want to grind through the heads of the rivets. We don't want to grind into our brackets, so we're going to take our time here. We could drill them off as well, but they usually end up spinning. This method works a lot better, at least for me. Maybe I should use a belt sander. What do you think, expert? Turn the heads off the rivets on the other bracket. A little bit more on this one. And it falls right off. This one will just tap out with the hammer. And our brackets are off. I might have cut a little too deep on those rivets and now we are left with a template. I actually only need to drill the two holes in the bottom bracket. The ones up in the top are there whether it's an LX or a GT. So we're going to use those to line everything up. We'll clamp our little template on here so it doesn't move around. 
we'll put the clamps underneath the molding in case we dent the fender and we don't have to worry about it. Down a little bit to get it lined up. Make sure all of our holes across the top are lined up and then we can go ahead and scribe those back ones. It takes just as much time to cut this piece of the fender off the old fender as it does to make a tape template or measure everything. And we can reuse this one if we ever get another Mustang that we want to put GT moldings on. Pull our clamps off of here and wipe some of our dirt off of here. So we can see where we scribed our holes. Now we'll go ahead and fill out our holes. I'm going to start with a nice small eighth inch drill bit. The holes in that bracket are slotted so that you have a little bit of play up and down in case you get the holes in the wrong spot. Or it left you lots of room for lots of adjustment all over this car. Tolerances were pretty lax back then. Our holes lined up, we're centered, so we're going to go ahead and throw the holes out to the size they're supposed to be for our rivets. Doesn't want to give me my drill bit back. Drill the bottom one out. And we did all this now so that when the painting gnome goes ahead and primes and paints our fender, this won't be bare metal. I don't know what size it is, but I know it fits in here, so it's the right size. Now we're going to go over and change our bumper over. We need to get our headlight mounting panel out of here. But in order to do that, we got to pull all of our lights out. Got one headlight. And the marker light. Just a couple nuts on the back and then they push out of there. more headlight and one more marker light. Now we can drill out more rivets. Because if I'm not drilling out spot welds, I'm drilling out rivets. Not sure which I dislike more. Now these aren't high speed drill bits, but we're only drilling through aluminum rivets. So if you go full throttle with the drill bit, it tends to cut through the aluminum and not spin the rivet. If you go a little bit slower, it'll catch the rivet and start spinning, and it's harder to drill the heads off. So if you go pretty quick, it'll get through the head and hopefully before it spins. Somebody's been here before. There's a couple of push pins in there where there's supposed to be some bolts. We'll pull those out of there, pull it off the rest of the rivets that are in there, and we're ready to pull our headlight mounting panel out from inside our bumper. It tucks underneath the edges of the bumper. So we just gotta pry it over the studs to get it out of there. It's a pretty snug fit. It gives the bumper its shape, so. Just gonna pry it over there. Once you get one side off, the other side isn't so bad. And it helps when the bumper is a little bit warmer. So I did bring it inside. But of course, like the heat in the shop doesn't work, so it's not that much warmer than outside. The office is nice and warm where the management is, but they don't care about the people actually making money for them in the shop, so they can freeze. Now we can pry this side out. Second side's definitely easier. Trim clip pliers work perfectly. Okay, it's supposed to be easier. Doesn't want to let go. And with the headlight panel out of the way, it makes it real easy to get to our emblem. There's just a couple of speed nuts on the back of it that hold it on there. Spin those off of there. And just push the emblem off. 
There's one stud that lines it up so you can't put it on upside down. And look at that, they circled the problem with this car. And now we're going to put our headlight mounting panel in our brand new GT bumper cover. It's a good thing that everybody told me in the other video that the bumper cover was for an LX or I never would have known. But I guess it's a good thing that I got it because now I have all this extra stuff that I would have had to buy if I would have, you know, not bought the LX bumper cover. You know, like an emblem and a headlight mounting panel and headlights and marker lights and a bumper reinforcement and bumper shocks. Maybe that's why I bought that LX bumper. I don't know. So we're going to put the headlight mounting panel in here first, even though the factory normally paints the bumper cover and then puts it together. But given the struggle to put these things in, we're going to do it this way. I don't mind if the rivets get painted. It, I'd much rather put this in, paint the rivets, and not have to worry about messing up the bumper and crawling back to the painting gnome telling him he needs to paint his bumper again. We'll put our headlight mounting panel in here. We'll set it on the car. And we're going to scuff underneath where our rivets are going to go so that we don't have our paint peeling. If we put our rivets in and then try to scuff around it, there's a chance of the paint peeling. If we scuff underneath it, we know it's all sanded. So we're gonna use the old fashioned hand riveter. I didn't feel like turning on the compressors to use the assault riveter. I guess I shouldn't say compressor since only one works now. Scuff each one of them. I put it on the car, it makes it a little easier to push on the bumper and get it nice and tight up against that headlight mounting panel. I could have done it on the stand, I guess. The rest of our roads in here. Our bodywork gnome got our bodywork done on our door and our fender, and there's a little ding in the quarter that the PDR guy couldn't get out. So we're ready to take our fender off of here so that they can paint the inside edge of this door, prime everything, and then go ahead and edge our fender, and then we'll put it back on when that's all done. So let's get our fender off of here and start stripping the rest of the car down. It was worth the time for me to put this fender up there to make sure that our molding lines up, make sure that the bodywork gnome could get his door nice and straight with the fender, and make sure that the fender didn't have any dents in it. PDR guy likes it on the car, so he straightened out the few that were in there. It's gonna take a little while to get it lined back up. That's really the only time we're gonna lose. Pulling it off here only takes less than a minute. So we're gonna give that to the painting gnome for him to go ahead and paint it up for us. And we're gonna start stripping our door down so that our bodywork gnome can prime it. Pull our door panel off. Try the switches out of here. Try to be gentle. The last guy wasn't. We're gonna unscrew the bezel from our switches because our switches are gonna kind of dangle in there and I don't want this bezel getting caught in the door and broken. So we'll pull it out of there. And we'll pull the bolts out of our armrest slash grab handle slash switch mount. Unclip it from the door. And this front tab is stuck in there. And our door panel pulls right off since there's no more Christmas trees left on it. We'll lift it off the top. And there's nothing else to unplug. Pretty simple door panel. Somebody's definitely been here before. I'm pretty sure that aluminum tape is not OEM. The duct tape, that was probably installed at the factory. Pull our water barrier down, that way we can get to our mirror. Then we're gonna pull the back of it down and see if we can figure out why our door locks don't work. And if I had to guess, I'd say our actuators are junk. Yep, they're still plugged in. And they just don't do anything. So we'll put the window down. That gets us access to the bolts on the back of the mirror. And our door locks still don't work. There's a little hole we can reach in and unplug our mirror. And the rear bolt we'll do with a wrench. 
there's actually studs on the mirror we're taking the nut off if you take the door handle out you can get a socket through the door but i don't want to take the door handle out so we'll just loosen it up with a wrench and spin it off with our fingers and try not to drop it down in the door and that was successful so the front one we can get with an impact and an extension we'll pull that one off and then pull our mirror off here Somebody's been here before. I'm going to pull this front piece of our belt molding off. There's supposed to be a stud on the back of it with a nut, and there is no stud, and it's two-sided tape down. That's not factory. Somebody has certainly been here before. I think I might have one on the parts car. Now to get the rest of the belt molding off, there's a little screw on the back of it. Pull that out of there. And the belt molding just slides back. There's a couple slots in the molding and it slides off those little plastic rivets. They're actually rivets, but they have little plastic washers on them that that molding slides over. Pull the little lock out for our door lock. And we can push our lock assembly out of the door. We don't need to take this off right now for him to prime it, but we're going to have to take it off eventually for him to paint it, so might as well get it out now. And the door has been painted before, so this lock's a little snug in there since it's got a couple layers of paint. We need to disconnect the rod. Just reach in from the back and unclip it. Now we can pull the base of the antenna off, pop the little cover off, and there's four screws in there. You really wanted to make sure it wasn't going anywhere. We need this out of the way because we're going to end up priming the entire fender because of all the paint issues. And our base is out. We'll throw that in our bucket. And we'll take our five point slow emblem off. You gotta make the emblem removal face or you risk breaking it. And now on to the back of the car, which had nothing to do with the accident, but our paint didn't want to stay on the car back here either. So we're gonna have to take our luggage rack off so that we can repaint the deck lid. I can only assume that Ford finally ran out of rivets, so they were nice enough to put a couple bolts in the back of this luggage rack, so we'll pull those out first. Then we'll unplug our third brake light. Try and stuff the grommet through, but it's 30 years old, it's a little tough, so we're going to wait. And they were nice enough to put two screws in, but then the jerks went and riveted the rest of it on. So now we got to drill our rivets off of here. And I wasn't going fast enough with the drill, so our rivet started to spin before I got through the head of it. And I did it again on the other side. So to get it out of there, we can lift up on that slat a little bit and bind the rivet up in there. Just enough to get the rest of the head off of it. Not enough to bend the slat or dent the deck lid. If you lift up too much, you will dent the deck lid. And it's supposed to be glued to the third brake light, but somebody's been here before. Clearly, it wasn't to paint the deck lid. There's a couple screws in our third brake light. Pull those out of there. And now we can get to our little grommet. We're going to use a pick very gently to get it started. If we get one part of it started, we'll work our way around. It's more like plastic now and not rubber. We'll probably have to warm it up a little bit to make it soft enough that we can pop it back in there when we're putting it back together. And there's a clip on the back side that is supposed to be adhered to the deck lid that fell off. It's still clipped on the wire, so we got to unclip that so we can get our wire to go through there. And we'll dump the screws out of there before we lose them. 
And now we can go on to drilling out more rivets. Ford was very fond of rivets on this car. We're going to drill a little bit on each one and then go back. We'll let it cool off that way so we don't melt into the plastic. Don't know that it helps that much, but it does in my mind, so that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm going back over it now. Once we get one end up, we can lift up on it and bind up that other rivet. And all of our slats are off. We'll deal with the rest of the rivets in a minute. All right, it's been a minute, so we're going to take the rest of our rivets out of here. We have a drill bit that's the same size as the rivets, so we're just going to drill straight down through them, and hopefully till we get to the deck lid and not actually drill into the deck lid. We get most of them out of there and twist off whatever's left or knock it through the deck lid, whatever works. We just need it out of there. I don't really care how it comes out. Look at all the dirt that was underneath that luggage rack. The clean freaks probably should have told this owner that you're supposed to remove the luggage rack every time you wash the car to clean under there. To preserve that OEM dirt, I think we're just going to tape off around it and leave it on there and then just paint the rest of the deck lid and then clear over it so that the next clean freak that takes this apart won't be able to get to the dirt. It'll drive them nuts. Well, that looks like about as far as we're going to be able to go on our Mustang for today. It's not that we run out of things to do. Um, our painting gnome got our door edged out. Uh, it's all primed and our fender's edged, so I could put that on and I have the rest of the car to strip down. No, we have technical difficulties. Uh, it appears the cameras don't bounce quite as well as we might hope they would. So tripod fell over, camera hit the ground, and it is, uh, well, in the pile. So we're filming on the backup iPhone. And if that wasn't bad enough, I also managed to delete the first half of this video. So I'm not sure if you guys are gonna to get to see it. I have to go and try and recover it. I was cleaning out my hard drive and somehow clicked that file and deleted all that footage. Let that be a lesson. That's why we don't clean things because bad things happen when you do. So we're just gonna leave everything dirty from now on. So I have to go recover that footage and get a new camera and we'll continue after that. It's just been one of those days. I guess that's what I get for working on a Ford. So thanks for watching and I'll see you hopefully with some new equipment and files that are still there. And on the off chance I can't recover the footage from the beginning of this video, welcome back to the channel. We're once again working on our 1993 Mustang GT convertible. Now last time we got everything together and we actually started changing over our bumper and getting that ready to go back on our car. Unfortunately, I lost all that footage, so you don't get to see that. So we're going to pick up where I managed not to lose the footage. Let's get started.